Imagine that you are a lorry driver and you see a headline like this. Or that you're an accountant and you see a headline like this. Or even a lawyer and you see one like this. We know that all of those headlines are driven by a set of trends, forces that are changing the world of work. Digital transformation, outsourcing, robotic process automation. And we know that these are forces that are delivering and will deliver incredible efficiency, productivity, and shareholder value. But if you are one of the employees, if you are one of the workers who's sitting in all of these roles that these technologies and trends are going to affect, then for you, your working future is pretty scary. Now, there's lots of different, these are all headlines that we've seen. And there's lots of different versions of the estimates of what the impact of all of this will be. And you can choose to pick any number of percentage jobs that will be eliminated, percentage jobs that will be affected, the overall total impact of these trends. There's lots of different versions of these. But whichever one you pick, what's not up for debate is that the way that we work is changing and will continue to change. So how do we, how do we make this real? And the question is, who in this scary world for our employees, for our teams, for our colleagues, for us, who's going to save us? And this sort of gets to the crux of my art. And yes, apologies for shifting. I believe that human resources professionals have the opportunity to be, and in many cases are, becoming the superheroes that we need to create a more positive working future for all of our colleagues. And now I know there's a general election going on right now, but I promise this is not a campaign speech pandering to my audience, there were plenty of people who agree with me. Harvard Business Review recently began talking about the idea of the G3. The CEO, the CFO, and the CHRO coming together as a team of three to run the business in a much more collaborative, uh, cross-functional way. FT has been talking about how the HR manager is a much more strategic role now than it once was. And earlier this year at the World Economic Forum's meeting at Davos, one of the most popular themes and sessions was about the idea of a reskilling revolution and the need for human resources leaders to take a lead role in creating positive and practical pathways for team members to see that even though these trends are definitely a reality and they are going to have an impact and in many cases are already having an impact on roles, there are more positive and practical ways that they can actually reinvent themselves, reskill, participate in an infrastructure for lifelong learning and change to get the roles and skills that they need to actually participate in this more positive future. Now, again, these are trends and headlines and reports. So what I'd like to do is to try to make this real over the next few minutes. At my company, General Assembly, we've had the opportunity to work with hundreds of large businesses around the world and specifically with some of these superheroes in creating and bringing to life really effective, impactful, innovative new pathways 
for employees to reskill themselves and participate in a transformed way in this more positive, more, more digitally transformed, more automated working future. And so I wanted to bring some of those examples to life for you. So I'll introduce you to three superheroes. This is Christoph. Christoph runs learning and development for BNP Paribas. And his big initiative is Skill Up. This is a big program that BNP Paribas launched uh, about a year and a half ago. I'm sorry, the mission is not coming through on the, I think the color issue there. But his mission is reskilling 10% of their workforce. And they've been very public about this. There's been a lot of press, a lot of talk, a lot of programs. And his superpower, what's making this really come to life, is really publicly championing the effectiveness and possibility of reskilling. He's out there using social media, he's using intranet, he's holding events, he's doing everything he can to more practically put forward ways that his teams and his employees can participate in this reskilling. Another superhero, Elena. Elena runs organizational development at Aegon, massive insurance company located all over the world. Her program is analytics for all. And the mission of this program is to give every single employee at Aegon, their ambition to put a number on it is 5,000 people, but it goes beyond that, to give everyone core analytic skills, saying that today, as insurance as a sector becomes so much more data-driven, everyone can benefit from having the analytic skills and to change their roles take advantage of those productivity benefits that we were talking about earlier, but to do so personally, not just to have some new team do it and actually build those skills for themselves. And they launched this program earlier this year. And the superpower here is a really tight connection with her business stakeholders. Her and, and, and Aegon's uh, chief analytics officer are connected so tightly in their strategy of reskilling people. And that's what's really making this program effective. This is not a human resources team doing something on one side and the business doing something on the other side. This is really about the two coming together and saying, how can we close our skills gap together and present that more practical way for our teams to work closely together? Finally, Suzanne's at Bloomberg. Bloomberg is one of these companies that's famous for tracking so much about what their employees do and taking a really data-driven approach to things. Her superpower is that she managed to convince Bloomberg to actually take time out of real time, not just a few hours, but weeks and in some cases months, to reskill employees who wanted to over three month long programs in data science. These are team members who are now taking on new roles and able to use new tools and become that much more productive, that much more confident, that much more effective. And the company is funding this. The company is putting these together. Now, they're not alone. There's plenty of other companies who are now starting to take matters into their own hands. And to say that if on the one hand, we are going to invest in these tools of automation and uh, digital transformation and all of these new things that are gonna have such a great impact for us, we have a responsibility and we can actually prove a cost uh, benefit if we reskill our employees to take advantage of these and to give them that sense of a positive working future. Now, it's certainly not every company, otherwise this wouldn't be such a political hot issue. But there are some companies, and I believe it's the superheroes at these companies who are leading the charge, 
to see this more positive future come to life for their employees. Most importantly, though, it's working. We are seeing marketing managers become UX designers. We're seeing project managers become product owners. Teachers become software engineers. Fine arts graduates become UX designers. And yes, even lorry drivers becoming data scientists. These are all real stories. These are real individuals who went through practical, intensive, reskilling experiences and came out the other side completely transformed and able to take on a new job. And just in our company alone, there's 100,000 stories like this, literally, across 25 cities around the world. Now, let's get practical, because I believe that every superhero needs a utility belt. The gadgets, the tools, the gizmos, the practices, the ways of working that actually bring some of this stuff to life. And to the point earlier from Shakil, the point here is that you guys need to walk away with some real insights and something practical that you can actually apply. So I want to introduce you to five things that we're seeing work in bringing these reskilling and positive working futures to life. So the first one is the idea of a rallying cry, right? This can't be just something that is happening from the HR team or just something that a team manager is doing or a few employees sort of, you know, saying they're going to reskill or participate in some classes or, you know, go to a course or something. This has to be a big and powerful commitment from the top that we are going to invest in our people to give them the skills they need to actually participate in this digitally transformed world. So this is a screen grab from a tweet from Bob Moritz, who's the uh, chairman of uh, PwC. A few, a couple of months ago, you may have seen, they made a $3 billion commitment to reskilling their people. Now, yes, you can say, you know, of course, as a professional services company, people are the asset, and so yes, we have to we have to do that in, in that sector. But it was only a few months before that that Amazon, of all companies, said that they were going to put 700 million to reskill 100,000 people. That's 7,000 US dollars per person. These are not the learning and development budgets that we're used to. These are big, bold commitments that it takes to actually transform people's jobs. These are companies sending their employees at scale to full reskilling experiences, to full new master's degrees, back to college to learn something new. This is not just a few hours in a workshop somewhere. Companies, leading companies, and the superheroes behind them are realizing that it's these kinds of commitments that you need to make if you're going to really create that positive work in the future. Another example. It's really difficult to tell what someone's starting point is when you're deploying one of these courses. It's getting really practical now. Simply saying, we're gonna put 100,000 people through a particular course means that you are absolutely going to waste some of your money, if not most of it. Because you're gonna have some people for whom that course is too advanced, you're gonna have other people for whom that course is too rudimentary. And so, one of the practices that we've seen come to life and in a really practical way is the idea of modern skills assessments. And now to be clear, these are practical assessments. These are tests, they're exams. They are industry backed, very practical diagnostic tests that help assess what a certain person's knowledge and ability is in a particular sector. We built these at our own company for digital marketing, user experience design, data science, software engineering. And these are the tests that help companies determine what the starting point for individuals should be. Should this person go on an advanced course or a really basic one? And they also help determine if that course actually worked because then there's a post-assessment as well. And we're seeing these come to life more and more as the starting point for these reskilling experiences. So that we don't just assume that we're going to send everyone on a particular course, 
we actually assess where they're starting and then make a recommendation from there. Next, the idea of agile strategic workforce planning. So continuing on with the example from BNP Paribas, one of the things that's been really successful for us there, they made a commitment to reskilling 10% of their workforce, starting with their insurance business, Cardiff. And what they didn't say was into what exact roles they will be reskilling people. Because this was a commitment that they were making for a large amount of funding over five years. And anyone who tells you that they can predict which roles they're going to need in five years is at best uh, optimistic and at worst is lying. And so the approach that we've taken here that we found super successful is we don't have any illusions that we can predict exactly what someone needs to learn and exactly what skills uh, they're going to need in five years. Instead, we've established a really tight, responsive, agile method of hearing what the business needs and planning and updating our reskilling calendars and programs based on that. So every month, we sit down with their head of strategic workforce planning, their learning and development team, and their chief digital officer. And they and we see data from across the business that says, here's the skills, here's the jobs that are open, here's what we're finding difficult to fill, these are what we think we need to invest in. It's a whole bunch of different metrics that we look at. And that literally determines what course corrections we need to make to our schedule for the next month. And it's that level of tight, responsive planning that enables us to actually meet the needs of the business and not try to have some crazy huge plan that we do here while the business actually needs something that's over here. This is a really uh, exciting initiative that we're seeing a lot of success with. The idea of the talent acquisition team and the learning and development team actually coming together to say that learning and development, reskilling, upskilling, should be a tool for talent acquisition. We don't have to just look externally for the roles that we need to fill. And so what Disney, what the Walt Disney Company is doing is, and they've now since expanded this program quite dramatically, is they are allowing any female workers across the company to raise their hand and say, I would like to take a role in software engineering. And literally anyone. It doesn't matter what department you're coming from. Because again, the other element that they have here is those assessments. So anyone can raise their hand and say, I would like to be considered any female employee. Because again, part of what they're trying to do here is correct some of their gender inequality, specifically in the technology function. And so any female employee at the Walt Disney Company can raise their hand and say, I would like to be considered for a software engineering role. They start by taking an assessment and going through a relatively rigorous admissions process. The first cohort of this had something like a thousand people apply and only 20 people got selected. Now, since they've expanded that, but that's still the level of rigor that's being put on this. There's a skills assessment, there's an admissions process, there's a test, there's an interview. And then these individuals go through an intense reskilling experience followed by two on-the-job apprenticeships, by the end of which they're able to take on jobs as software engineers. And so far, almost everybody who's gone through this program has successfully taken on that new role. Thereby allowing, the, thereby allowing the Walt Disney Company to, instead of continuing to compete for technical talent with Google and Amazon and everybody else who wants a software engineer, to simply say, we can actually increase the net supply ourselves and give our own employees a more practical and clear way to reskill for the future. And finally, here in the UK specifically, we're seeing apprenticeships more broadly 
become a really exciting way for people who otherwise wouldn't have had access into some of these roles in technology, data, design, marketing to get those. So we're working with a company called White Hat, which is a um, young, new apprenticeship startup that's embracing digital apprenticeships in particular. So data, software engineering, digital marketing, more to come, where they're creating an entirely new learning experience and apprenticeship experience tied to, of course, specifically in the UK, government funding that's allowing them to reskill people, give them the skills they need, and actually be an on-ramp into their first job. And in some cases, this is now actually being used for existing employees as well to reskill them for the future. And we're the education component of it. So the more formal side of it, the courses and things like that we're delivering. And what it's allowing these HR superheroes to do is to look to alternative ways of alternative new pipelines for talent. Again, it's not just the employees we have here. It's not just what we get from the recruiting team. It's also apprentices. It's also our own employees that we can reskill. And so it's solving a problem for the company by creating a more positive way and a more practical way for everyone to participate in that and work in the future. So in closing, there are some scary new trends that are having a impact on the way that we think about the future of work. But I, I truly believe that HR leaders can be the superheroes that we need if they have the right utility belts. Thank you.